welcome everybody to today's webinar on the topic of dissecting and discussing clinically complicated cases. My name is Heidi Aguia, and I welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we, we have some great speakers today for you, some very fascinating cases. Um, but before we introduce those speakers, for those of you who have not joined us previously, I just want to briefly explain to you how the platform works for this webinar. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner, you will see a blue icon. If you click on that icon, that's where you can shoot us a chat message if you are having any troubles or if you have any questions for the speakers. You can do so at any time throughout the presentation, uh, but we will be holding those questions till the end. Um, you will see on the top left-hand corner a settings wheel where you can check on audio features and find a dial-in number. If, if you are having troubles with your computer audio, you can dial in on the phone as well. <clears throat> Coming up, um, and registration is open for this, uh, on May 23rd, we have a webinar on the topic of transplantation across humoral barriers. Also, uh, registration is open for our annual brain death webinar that's geared towards physicians. It's on the topic of moving toward better quality and uniformity around brain death declaration. And this is a 90-minute webinar, and CMEs are going to be provided for this webinar as well as the usual continuing education credits. For this webinar today, we are offering one SEPC credit, and we are also offering 1.2 nursing contact hours. Um, please note that everybody who's listening to the webinar today is able to get the continuing education credits. Now, some of you are listening in groups, so whoever registered for this webinar and received the link for the webinar will be the one that receives the evaluation email. So please make sure you take note of everybody who's in the room and forward that evaluation email to your colleagues so that everyone can submit for the continuing education credits. Please note that for nursing, you only have 14 days to complete your evaluation. Um, or to, uh, to submit for your credits. For sepsis, you do have 30 days. So at this stage, I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is Tanya Hull. Uh, she's a member of our Get Connected webinar faculty and helped to coordinate this webinar. And she's also a procurement transplant coordinator for the Legacy of Life in Hawaii. So I'm going to turn it to Tanya to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Hetty. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, we have William Peoples. He's an organ procurement coordinator with LifeQuest Organ Recovery Services. Bill is a graduate of the University of Central Florida that launched his career in the nursing field, where he has been for 22 years. Bill's career started at Monroe Regional Medical Center in Ocala, Florida, in the Coronary Intensive Care Unit. He moved into the critical care education role in 2001 and remained as a clinical education coordinator for 15 years at the same facility. During that time, he took on supporting roles in employee health, joint commission readiness, hazmat emergency teams, and became the American Heart Association Training Center Coordinator for MRMC. He currently maintains instructor status for BLS, ACLS, and PALS disciplines and, and continues educating. Bill has been a member of the LifeQuest Organ Recovery Service team for one year and will soon sit for his CPTC certification. He and his incredible wife, Renee, reside in Ocala, Florida with their six teenage children. He often volunteers to work extra shifts just for a break. We're also welcome to have Sean Forker on the call with us. Sean serves as a supervisor of organ recovery at Southwest Transplant Alliance. He has been at Southwest Transplant Alliance for five years, and prior to coming into organ donation field, he worked as a critical care and emergency nurse for 12 years. I'd like to turn it over to Bill at this time. All right, Tanya, thank you very much. I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the Alliance for uh, allowing us to uh, talk about uh, some of these cases here, and uh, uh, you know, we'll go, go from there. Um, I've lived in Florida all my life, um, and so 40 plus years, and so we have these uh, incidences or things that come up here in Florida, and we call them hurricanes. And so, um, you know, if, if those of you, and I know we have a pretty wide variety of people from everywhere here that have never experienced that, um, just know that it's, it's a pretty big ordeal that we have down here. Um, you know, these, these storms, they'll come up, they're, um, 
They can be a little bit unpredictable as to where the landfall will be. Um, they can be absolutely devastating. They'll turn into, uh, they'll create tornadoes. Uh, um, you're looking at um, resources that are depleted very quickly, and you also have a loss of power and a lot of the things that we take for granted when we're on cases um, that'll happen. Um, I kind of equate it to, you know, it, it's going to be bad. You're not sure for how long, but you have time to prepare. So it's a little bit like your in-laws visiting for, uh, for the holidays. Um, so we had back in um, October of last year um, Hurricane Matthew that decided to, to make its way up to Florida. Um, a little bit late in our season, we start in June and um, usually, uh, you know, extend all the way up to October and November for our hurricane season. Um, but it made its way um, down from the Mexico area and it kind of marched up our coastline. Um, and our, the, they have this thing called the cone of uncertainty of where the landfall actually will be. So it makes it a little bit hard to predict exactly where it will hit. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it uh, ended up looking like it was going to hit in, in an area that uh, we frequent quite a bit, um, our Jacksonville area up in the uh, northeast uh, corner of Florida. Um, and at that time, just a few days prior, we had a uh, – uh, poor, un unfortunate 55-year-old female patient that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a referral that came in. Um, initially had GCS of five. Um, she uh, quickly uh, decompensated and uh, due to an cranial hemorrhage and then uh, was declared brain dead uh, right as the storm was was close to approaching. Uh, we have about 24 hours of. Uh, uh, being able to get in to, and to evaluate this patient and to start work on this patient. Um, so we had some of our uh, family advocates, of course, going in. They, they uh, obtained consent. Um, the patient was actually on the registry. Um, and so um, that part was an easier part. Um, and then we have some of our local OPCs that, um, you know, were there available to start the, and initiate the case. Um, because the hurricane was actually heading toward that area and a lot of Jacksonville is in a low-lying area and we have some of our OPCs, of course, that reside there, um, utilizing staff in that local area um, for any long length of time was, was probably not the best um, idea when the hurricane would actually hit. So we want to allow those people to um, have time to go home and, um, you know, have their um, – place ready and boarded, windows boarded up or what have you. Um, so uh, we were good enough to uh, uh, have uh, actually myself come up from Ocala, which I'm more from a centrally based uh, location. Uh, we were going to get some wins, but not certainly not like Jacksonville was going to get um, and actually take the case over. And one of the things you have to keep in mind with some of these natural disasters is the flexibility of your emergency preparedness plan. Um, we seem to uh, have to take ours out and review, review ours uh, quite frequently just because of the storms that we have here in Florida. If you don't have an emergency uh, preparedness plan, you probably should have one in place, and I think you should probably uh, review it annually. Um, look at its flexibility, make sure that it's up to date, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, that your resources are the same, hasn't changed, um, because uh, doing that uh, uh, 24 hours or uh, as the, uh, the storm's approaching, it's probably not the best time to do it. Um, you know, we, we have uh, our staff, when they travel on the roads, um, kind of follow along a lot like the emergency uh, medical services. Uh, we don't really want anybody to be on the road when you have sustained winds over 35 miles an hour. Um, and you folks can actually Google and go on to uh, YouTube and kind of look at this hurricane. It was, I believe, a Category 4 at one time. Um, and was looking at a category uh, two to three um, by the time it was going to uh, get near Jacksonville. Um, and that certainly is going to have winds that are going to be impacted of at least 120 miles an hour there. Um, so having anyone on the road uh, moving around is probably uh, not a good idea. Uh, we had decided earlier on that uh, we would um, go initiate the case, stay for as long as it was going to be safe um, to start that case um, and then transfer this case and, and actually um, 
medically manage this patient from a distance, a safer distance by phone, um, and then um, actually get back on site as soon as possible. Um, there is, was a potential of actually having someone stay there at the hospital and, um, you know, of course every situation is a little unique. Uh, we chose to do it this way, um, you know, having one of our coordinators actually spend a night with the staff there at the hospital uh, would certainly be another option as well. Um, so, but we, we chose this option and it, it worked pretty well for us. Um, we have, um, uh, when we send our serologies, at the time we were sending serologies down to uh, uh, our Miami area, um, which involves quite often a, a plane flight. Um, that was uh, a little bit uh, tricky because, of course, no planes were flying at that time um, along the uh, uh, Florida coast area, so, uh, and it's not terribly out of the question to, to send it down by courier, so that's how we handled our serologies. Um, and of course, that takes a little longer, but we were in for the long haul in this case anyway. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of incidents with that, but just think of the potential that could happen, you know, as far as uh, sending, you know, blood work to your labs or HLAs and those things uh, because of couriers may not be able to get out on the road because uh, of, of the weather, um, and uh, you might have some delays in, in how that impacts your case, um, you know, could certainly slow things down. Um, you're also going to be looking at here a little bit about the potential of, you know, the transplant teams to arrive. Um, when you have an airport that's shut down because of, of flooding and electricity, that, that can be also a, a big issue as well. And here is just kind of a brief little timeline of, of how we handled it and um, how we were physically on site um, at, um, at our donor hospital, which happened to be a transplant center, thank goodness, um, because uh, um, afterwards, you know, in, in offering organs up uh, made it a whole lot easier. Um, you know, we arrived at the site a little bit on the 5th, uh, went, um, got off site um, early morning of the 6th, and we're actually back on the site on the 8th, um, returned to the hospital. Um, on return to the hospital, uh, they were on emergency power. They didn't get a direct hit um, from Hurricane Matthew. Um, and some of these pictures that are actually that little picture that's on the PowerPoint is a screenshot of some of the areas in Jacksonville. Um, you know, so they had a lot of power that was out. They had trees that were down. They had uh, roads that were blocked. Um, and so, um, you know, certainly the airport was an issue there. Um, staffing at the facility, they were on short staffed uh, because they were basically um, just there for what needed to meet the needs of the hospital. We had limited resources. Um, in fact, uh, one of the limitations uh, that affected our case was because of the power issues, the emergency power that affected the cardiac cath suite. Um, and that complicated by staffing not being available to do a cardiac cath um, unless it was a true emergency, um, we were not able to um, place the heart for this patient because of that reason. Um, there was some also uh, questionable things in the echo that, that uh, allowed us to, to not be as aggressive, but I think um, in the long run we probably wouldn't have been able to place anyway because of uh, certainly some things that Hurricane Matthew caused. Um, uh, the travel restrictions, weather impacted us a little bit and impacted our, our courier system a little bit. Certainly would impact uh, a lot of our transplant centers if they were coming, um, you know, uh, if that was the case. And, and for the most part, it wasn't so much the case with that because um, all of our um, organs that we were able to, uh, to get from our donor were actually, um, uh, recipients were right there. Um, your safety of your staff, and certainly our staff, is always a primary consideration. Um, you know, the transplant teams, flights in and out, was always a consideration too as well. Um, fortunately for us, the management of our donor, um, this patient was um, thankfully a very stable uh, donor through the entire ordeal. Uh, we did not really have to worry about putting the patient on any significant amount of pressors. Um, and uh, we didn't have a problem at all medically managing um, this patient by phone. The uh, nursing staff at Mayo Clinic is exceptional. 
um, and uh, you know they uh, they were able to follow our instructions very clearly. We had our communications thankfully weren't interrupted. Um, so cell phone service, which is another thing that an internet that we sometimes take for granted that could lose um, you know you could lose that during some of these storms um, that remained intact. So uh, you know we we were um, good in that aspect. Um, the recipients uh, when we were actually um, um, allocating organs out. Uh, we did have some recipient issues, um, you know, one involving our liver recipient um, who actually um, started to become very unstable about an hour before the OR. Um, and so, um, you know, because of the limitations that we um, had as far as transplant teams being able to fly in and fly out, um, you know, local backup was having to be given there at the facility for that. and. Uh, you know, fortunately, they had a patient there that was able to uh, take the liver, and um, and that was great. Um, so a lot of things that could have happened really negatively in in this storm uh, didn't, and and we're very thankful for that. Um, but it does bring a lot to light here about the things that could go wrong, and you want to you want to kind of plan for that ahead of time, um, you know, before you get into problems with that. Um, the the short story to everything here is the results that we had um, with this donor is we were able to successfully transplant uh, in block lungs with this patient, um, the liver as well, and, the, and both kidneys, um, and the majority of which um, stayed there at the transplant center. Um, and I always think it's kind of ironic that that hurricane, according to uh, our news reports, took the lives of four Floridians, and uh, our donor in turn uh, saved the four lives, uh, lives of four Floridians at that time. Um, so a little bit ironic, but uh, you know, it, and all in all, it ended up uh, being very, uh, a, a very good case. Um, and I think uh, if there's no further questions, I'll turn it over to Sean for his. All righty. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for that. That was definitely a very uh, interesting case that you guys had to deal with. Uh, the case I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of was a first for us. Um, we had a, a donor whose cause of death was acute cyanide toxicity, and um, we we'd never really run into this. Um, so we're going to kind of take you through. Um, the, the process and the journey that we went through dealing with this uh, very unusual donor. So initial presentation, um, this 20-year-old gentleman um, had a purposeful ingestion of cyanide while at college, um, got immediate, I mean, everything worked well. He got immediate bystander CPR, EMS was dispatched immediately. They, uh, they um, secured his airway and provided ventilatory support as soon as he hit the door in the emergency department. Uh, he started immediately getting the uh, antidotes for cyanide, sodium thiosulfate and uh, hydroxycobalamin. Um, ultimately, this young man died of an anoxic injury, um, which due to the mechanism of action of cyanide, certainly not uh, terribly shocking. So, this young man was declared brain dead. And this was kind of the clinical situation at the time of approach. Blood pressure is meh, pretty okay. I mean, our, our labs look really good until we look at his ABG. And on 100% oxygen, his PO2 is only 58. Oh, wow. And this guy's on bi-level, on very aggressive ventilatory support, and we found out that day that the upper assay limit of the lactate um, test at that hospital is 13.3. It just, so the lactate was tilt. We don't know what it is, but it's real, real high. So now we're thinking, well, as my boss, as my boss at the time likes to observe, all the organs like oxygen. So can we deliver this oxygen to the organs? Um, what does cyanide do to the organs? Is cyanide going to alter the organs in some way 
that would make this tr- make a transplant unsafe. We don't know. And even if it doesn't, could we find a transplant center willing to take a chance, um, willing to accept accept an organ offer from such a donor? So, um, if like me, I, I worked in the emergency department for a number of years. What did I know about cyanide? It's bad, number one. And number two, go get the cyanide kit from the charge nurses station. So we had to reach out to uh, some friends that we'd made in the toxicology department and learn a little bit about what cyanide does to you. So what did we find out? It inhibits Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. I'm not going to belabor the specifics, but basically it keeps the mitochondria from using oxygen for cellular respiration. So even though you have adequate amounts of oxygen, the mitochondria just can't use it. So it might as well not be there. Um, as a result, you get high lactate levels because you're using anaerobic metabolism. It also changes the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen. And now the oxygen can the hemoglobin will not give up the oxygen to the tissues. And even if we could do that, the mitochondria are still altered by the cyanide. So we've got this double whammy of oxygen delivery problems that was really, uh, really causing us some concerns. So we decided to go ahead because a PO2 of 58 is bad, but the metabolic demands of a brain-dead organ donor are also very low. So our thoughts were, is this donor getting just enough oxygen to get by? Are the organs getting enough oxygen to not, start, to not suffer hypoxemic injury? And everything that we saw indicated that that was the case. Our creatinine wasn't elevated. Our liver enzymes were not elevated. We were making urine. We were conjugating bilirubin. So every functional test of organ function said, yeah, we're, we're getting by. We're doing, what we, we're doing our, our function. So what we decided to do was we made a treatment plan, um, basically maximize oxygenation. So um, we used high FiO2. We put this donor on APRV. Um, and they had previously been on inverted ratio pressure control. We weaned them from APRV to pressure control later in the case. Um, we gave more cyanide uh, antidotes. So we had given, they had given one dose of the hydroxycobalamin in the emergency department. We repeated that. Um, and it binds to cyanide and makes it um, less lethal. Um, and here's some data about it, if you ever find yourself in that situation. Um, some other things that we, we thought about, um, sodium thiosulfate um, works well, but does have that delayed onset. And then we saw one article, now there is not a great amount of literature on donors and cyanide. So that was, um, that was pretty difficult for us. But it mentioned, we found one donor in a pediatric journal where they used an exchange transfusion to, um, to reverse cyanide toxicity from a patient who had been on nipride for apparently a long period of time. So we thought, how would we do an exchange transfusion if we had to? We kind of kept that as a last ditch. If things start going badly, we'll do the exchange transfusion. But the hospital we were doing the donor at didn't have the ability to do that. So we were going to get a little unconventional. Um, and basically what we asked for were thoracentesis bottles to bedside and a rapid transfuser. And our thought process was if we had to, 
that we would essentially draw a unit, maybe two units of blood off the donor via the A-line, and immediately replace it with blood that has not been altered by cyanide via the rapid transfuser. The problem with this that we identified early on, one, it's only going to fix half the problem. Great, you fix the RBC problem that now we've given normal RBCs that don't have this ridiculously strong affinity for oxygen and will actually give oxygen to the tissues, wonderful. But what we haven't solved is the way that cyanide altered the mitochondria. So we, we realized that it was not exactly a, a solution so much as a Band-Aid. Other things that we immediately knew about this and why we wanted to keep it in our back pocket was the fact that you can really only do it once. So the first time you do it, you know you're just taking cyanide-altered blood out and replacing it with good blood. But if we were to do it again, we would be taking some cyanide-altered blood out, but also some functional RBCs. And we didn't necessarily want to do that. And then there's also the added factor of donor instability. If I'm essentially going to perform a, a therapeutic venipuncture on this person and deliberately make them bleed out 300 to 600 milliliters of blood, could we have some unwelcome donor instability that would make an already challenging donor even more challenging? So we, were, we thought that that could help, but we also thought that it could make life perhaps a little more interesting than we wanted it to be. So we kept that solution kind of in our back pocket. So what, did we, what we decided to do was APRV. Um, we kept the exchange transfusion in reserve in case we needed to do it. We gave a fair amount of bicarb drips uh, to treat the lactic acidosis. And one of the first things we did, make some interest calls. Would you even think about this? Our local centers, if we were to offer you this, would you even consider it? Or would, we, would this become the bridge to nowhere where we tried really hard and nobody was interested, nobody wanted to take the risk? We did find some people who said they'd be interested, so we, we went ahead and embarked on this. Um, we did a pretty expedited allocation. Um, this lactic acidosis had us pretty concerned. We didn't know if it was getting better or worse because the, we were above the assay limit of 13. So I just know I got a bad lactic acidosis, but I don't know which way it's trending. So is, is this donor's condition about to get much worse on me? Do do we need to just hurry up and go? And that's kind of what we felt, was we needed to expedite allocation. Additionally, the family had been through a very long and arduous process, um, and they were very concerned and ready for this process to be done. So they, they had expressed some desire for this case to go uh, a little bit more quickly. So... After managing overnight, we had some interesting, uh, we had some interesting challenges overnight. Uh, one of my colleagues came out and started the case, did a phenomenal job. Um, but sometimes these unlikely donors, we forget, and he and I certainly forgot, to recruit our hospital partners, get them on board. Um, and so the intensivist, we asked him for a bronc uh, when we arrived because we thought that that could potentially help our oxygenation picture. But he, uh, he declined. He said, uh, you guys aren't getting the lungs, so uh, I'm, I'm going home. So luckily, my partner that started this case been an RT for a number of years and was trained to do therapeutic bronx um, in his RT life. And so after a talk with our AOC, he went ahead and did a therapeutic bronch, which did help slightly. Um, the bronchoscopy was actually 
pretty benign. The next morning, when the intensivist arrived back, he was shocked and rather dismayed to find us still in his hospital. And as a result, he felt that this was a misallocation of resources, and he was very upset by this. Um, we reiterated that our job is to evaluate the, the suitability of organs for transplant, but in the absence of overwhelming evidence that organs are not transplantable, we have to let our transplant centers make that final decision for their patients. He was somewhat mollified by that, and things got a little better later on. Um, right before we allocated, this was kind of our clinical picture. Creatinine's trending up, urine output is still okay, and our liver still appears to be pretty happy. Lactate level is still tilt. But between APRV and and the bronch, our oxygenation's gotten a lot better. So now we are a little more, we have a little more room to breathe, so to speak, and pardon the pun. Um, we have our, our reason to believe, okay, things are getting better. We're, we should be able to deliver oxygen, and it looks like our organs are receiving adequate oxygen. So, okay, it's working. So, big thing that we ran into is, is this inhibition of the mitochondria to utilize oxygen, is this permanent? The answer is no. Um, amid the very large chemical cocktail that is cigarette smoke is cyanide. And cigarette smokers do not drop dead immediately upon smoking. They take in a much smaller amount of cyanide than our donor did, but the body can metabolize it if it can survive that initial hypoxemic insult. Um, as we discussed earlier, there is almost nothing published on the safety of, you, of donors who died of cyanide toxicity in organ donation. So every surgeon who was even contemplating this offer, they made real good friends with toxicology, and so did we, to get the advice of an expert. Like, is this, is this safe to do? Am I going to put this in my patient, and are they going to have a horrible outcome? So there was a lot of due diligence, a lot of research that everybody had to do. Needless to say, we were not exactly holding, uh, holding our transplant center's feet to the fire on that one-hour acceptance, uh, given, the, given the very tiny amount of literature and the, and the stakes. So actually, real quick, we talked about our intensivist colleague and how he was concerned and upset about us taking up hospital resources on this person that he saw as having no donation potential. So after visiting with my colleague that morning where, he, where we laid out like this is our philosophy on donation and how, how we partner with the transplant centers, he thought about it for a while. Then he came by and talked to me and he looked at the labs, and the labs had all pretty much improved. Oxygenation had improved dramatically. And this donor's physiologic condition looked worlds better than when he had left. And so he's like, now he's thinking, okay, yeah, maybe there is some donation potential. So our heart program asked for a swan, and in Texas, Getting a swan floated can be a little challenging. Uh, not as many hospitals are doing them, and not as many people are trained in how to float them. This same physician that had said, I'm going to put a stop to this and kick you guys out of the hospital, and that is almost a verbatim quote, came in that night and floated a swan for me and spent two hours floating it and troubleshooting it to get the information that we needed for the heart team. So this case had a transformative relationship, a transformative action on our relationship with this physician. So what's the end result? We recovered heart, liver, and bilateral kidneys. One year post-transplant, all the recipients are doing well. 
Um, th these are some of our labs before we went to the OR. We were able to wean down on our ventilatory support. Creatinine peaked and came down. And we finally got a lactate that didn't say tilt. So we were really, we were really encouraged by this case. Now, honestly, I think if the, if the cyanide hadn't been altering our PO2s, I think the lungs would have been transplantable. But without, uh, without a normal ABG, that's a difficult thing to prove. And then those are my references. All right, so I will turn it back over. Um, I will turn it back Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much, um, Sean and Bill, for uh, two very fascinating cases. Um, just as a reminder for those of you who are um, listening as participants, on the bottom left-hand corner is the chat icon. That's where you will type in your questions for the speakers, and we will, um, Tanya will be moderating those. And as we navigate those questions, um, there's a poll up here for those of you who are listening as a group. If you can please be so kind to complete that poll as to how many people are in your group. So I will turn it to Tanya to get us started with the questions. Thank you, Hetty. Our first question is for Bill. Bill, what education or prep does LifeQuest um, have with your hospitals to get them to agree to maintain or declare donors during an emergency? Or, and are there any hospitals that won't do that? Um, I don't believe there's really any particular policy in place, you know, regarding an emergency that would be any different than what we would have in place if it's um, a, uh, just like any other case. I don't think they differentiate between emergencies, uh, you know, issues versus just uh, our routine cases. Um, you know, we, we allocate the, or we utilize the resources that are available, and, you know, if they're not, then, you know, we try to troubleshoot and then we move on. It, it, to have a policy, I think, in place um, that, would, that would take care of any potential issue that could happen in the, in, um, you know, in, in some of these these uh, disaster um, scenarios, uh, the policy would be hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Um, so, I mean, other than just some general things of, of having things available, um, I can't think of any particular one that would be different than, than what we normally would experience. And do you have any standing protocols um, that you give to the hospitals in case communication is lost during these cases? Uh, we don't have any standing protocols. I mean, we do utilize and we try to get as many phone numbers, you know, whether they be landlines or cell phones. Um, you know, of course, you know, we all utilize our cell phones um, and the hospitals have the, the landlines available to us as well. Um, you know, we do have some other, you know, methods of communication. Um, if for some reason the, that communication got broke down, um, you know, certainly we could utilize email, we could utilize fax machines. Um, and, you know, at, uh, you know, worst case scenario, if we needed to send somebody provided that the, um, you know, the environment would allow um, to physically have somebody on there um, to, to address communication that way. Okay, Sean, for the cyanide case, could you please share the specifics of the brain death exam and the discussions leading up to the determination? Uh, certainly. So with this case, it um, obviously due to his uh, due to his poor oxygenation, they deferred the uh, apnea test. But they did a clinical exam, which was areflexic, and they sent him down to cerebral blood flow, uh, which showed no flow. And uh, so they declared him based off those two findings. Uh, the discussions leading up to it. Um, there, it was really pretty standard discussion. Um, unfortunately, our uh, physician colleague who later indicated such, um, such reservations about the case did not share them at the time of the brain death pronouncement. Um, what was the time frame from the initial labs with the ingestion to organ acceptance?
so he there was about about 36 hours from the time he presented to the emergency department to the time that he became an organ donor and we were on site we were on site for about uh, 12 to 16 hours before we started allocation. So grand total, I think we're looking at about 48, roughly 48 hours from cyanide ingestion to organ allocation. Okay. Um, Bill, from the HD perspective, how do you address concerns from the hospital that you should not be doing an organ donor donation during a disaster? For example, they might say limited resources should be held in reserve to address the disaster. Um, well, personally, the, you know, and I don't believe that we've uh, necessarily come across a, a problem um, with this during disaster. I mean, we don't have, the hurricanes don't happen too often, and I'm sure there's probably other disasters as well, and there might be some argument that, that would say that, you know, we, that, you know, that we need to have those resources, um, you know, maybe held back. But, um, you know, m my argument is, is that, you know, we, we have a job to do. Um, we're there to, for, you know, not only the families of the of the donors, but we're also there for the recipients as well. Um, and so I don't think that, um, you know, uh, you know, certainly that argument. I don't know if it would stand up any differently than what we would normally um, basically say. And that's what we're there to do, and and we have a job to do. Um, so um, I, I haven't had a hospital address us you know, with those concerns, you know, regarding um, limited resources and us not being able or shouldn't be doing organ donation during a disaster. But if we had, I think that would probably be our initial response um, is that, uh, that, you know, we're not going to do anything different, um, you know, certainly based off of just because the, the happens to be in the middle of a disaster. Um, I think, you know, we were prudent in the decision, you know, that, you know, uh, we weren't going to call in physicians to come in and do a cardiac catheterization on our particular patient um, because, well, first of all, her echo was kind of borderline to begin with, um, you know, and, and showed some indication that the heart may not be transplantable and she, would, she had been down for a, a little bit. So I think, um, you know, in, in that case, I think we would have been prudent. Um, you know, I, we wouldn't want to put their hospital staff at risk for coming in uh, for things, you know, any more that we would want our own uh, staff to be put at risk for um, coming in for inclement weather issues. So I think, you know, that that could be argued well there, but uh, anything else I don't think uh, would, would stand up to a decent argument. Uh, Sean, did your, were there any specific requests from your transplant centers for any additional testing or information they needed? Um, yes. So um, one center asked for a cyanide level. Um, unfortunately, that is a send-out lab at the hospital we were doing the donor at. So we can do it, but you'll find out after you transplant your recipient. Um, and then another one asked for um, for a swan, which I don't think had anything to do with the cyanide toxicity um, at all. So really it was just a matter of them, they, they kind of had a good picture of the donor. What they didn't have was a lot of information on how safe it would be to accept organs from such a donor. Sean and Bill, I want to thank you for your presentations. Hetty, if there's no other questions, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, so Bill and Sean, thank you so much for sharing um, two very fascinating cases and challenging cases, and it, it just shows that you have the choice to walk away or you have the choice to think outside of the box and research it and fig figure out how to make it happen. And um, 
and most of the time when we do that, it, it's possible. <laughs> so um, thank you both for sharing that and for um, hopefully encouraging and, and inspiring us if we all face those types of situations. Um, thank you to all the participants for listening in today. Um, we wish you a wonderful rest of the day, and for the speakers, I will move us back into the speaker room. Have a great rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.